Um, I said first service, uh, after 15 years of uh, uh, being a partner with Chris uh, and uh, the idea that I never know what he's going to say or do. So that was a new one uh, for what he's doing. So number seven or number 10, 10. 10 as well. Um, so my name is Walt Tanner. We're the pastor here at Capstone. For those of you who are watching online, those of you who are hanging out with us, uh, again, we think it's an honor that you are spending your Sunday morning with us, uh, especially for those of you who've maybe had a busy summer, decided, hey, I want to check out a new church, or you're just like, hey, I wanted to see what this whole uh, church thing was about. If you're new to church, we're so glad uh, you're here. And so we want to be a place for people who are searching, whether it's searching spiritually uh, and you're being called uh, out of something and the hopelessness of trying to save yourselves. We'd love to point you to Jesus. Or if you're here new to our community and looking for uh, a new church home, uh, we, there are amazing churches in Fountain Inn. Uh, we're just one part of that. And so we are glad you were here. So we're going to start a new series today and we're going to start right in God's word. So we're going to be in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And this is what God's word says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said the light was good and God separated light from the darkness and God called the light day and darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So in the beginning, the universe was this formless void. There was no order. There was no life. There was no value. And as we sang in the song ahead, just as we just sang, it says that God took the chaos. He formed us from the dust, but there was chaos before that. And so the idea that there's this chaos that is, that is, that is over and, and they are hovering, the Holy Spirit of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they're hovering over this chaos and they're drawn to this chaos of formless, lifeless void. And in the midst of that chaos came order. And as he brings this order, he, uh, he ultimately gives this purposeless void purpose. And don't miss why he did what he did. He did this for his glory. The whole creation story is not about me, but he. And so the reason he threw the stars in the sky, the reason he formed the mountains with his hands, the reason he breathed life into us was not about me, but he. And as he did that, he created this universe. He created this world. He created us to worship him. And so as he took this and created man, it was, this universe was not haphazardly created. As he created these stars, as he created these planets, it was with purpose. So as God created and he created these stars, created these planets, he, he grouped them together in what we call galaxies. And in these galaxies, he, he created these, these worlds and, and these planets and all of these things. And, and, and we live in a galaxy. Anybody know what galaxy we live in? Milky Way, good. You've seen Men in Black. Excellent. All right. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy. And so in the Milky Way galaxy, I looked up how many stars, stars were in the Milky Way galaxy, and it is 100 b -b billion to 400 billion, depending on stars that die and they get started up. And so between 100 billion and 400 billion stars in one galaxy, and our universe is made up of ever-growing galaxies. And so in our one galaxy, let's take the low number of 100 billion stars. In our galaxy, you know how many stars there are that create, that, that support life? One out of 100 billion, there is one star, the sun. And our sun has, this, uh, has these planets rolling around it. And of all the stars of 100 billion, of the one star, there's this one planet. This one planet that is within what we call the Goldilocks realm or the habitable zone. And so in that, we begin to see how God's balance works. That we begin to see how understanding of this God takes this chaos and creates order. And so as he does this, we begin to see that God is working. He, he's working in ways that if our planet was one, and this is science, not, not just the idea of church and, and scripture, but the idea of science that supports scripture. Sometimes we run away from science, but if we lean into science, go, man, science, you actually validate what we just read. Because if we were one degree closer to the sun, we would, uh, basically the matter that takes up and creates life is water. If there's no water, there is no life. And if we were one degree closer and God didn't put us in balance, it would freeze. We would not have life. If we're one degree further away, guess what? 
is it evaporates because it's too hot. And so where God perfectly places us around the one star out of the hundred billion in our galaxy of what is known to be of planets that could be five sextrillion, which is five with 28 zeros behind it. As the universe is looked at, there is one ball of dirt that supports life that we know of. And so God has said, balance. I'm going to put this ball right where it needs to be of all the universe, that if it was a little closer, a little further, it wouldn't work. But it's just not where he placed us. It's also the, the rate at which we spin. That if we spun slower or faster, this wouldn't work. Lifeless planet. But it's just not how fast we're spinning. It's also our tectonic plates. That science, again, science has shown that if our tectonic plates, because they've looked at other planets and they've been able to see and they've looked at Mars and they say, we are unique in our tectonic plate, plate, uh, plates in the way that it has created the, the surface of our planet. And then there's the gas that surrounds it and the atmosphere that it is unlike any other planet that has been found in any of the universe that he perfectly created this one planet. Let's go with the moon and the gravity and orbit. If one of those things is off balance, if one of those things does not work, we are not here. So you begin to see that our God is a God of balance. Now you might go, well, why does balance even matter? Well, as we continue to talk, we'll see that God, we want to show you that God is a God of balance and boundaries. We're going to talk about that for the next four weeks. We're also going to look at Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, that his life and his ministry of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we study that here on earth, it was full of balance and boundaries. And I want to also lead you to the Holy Spirit that dwells in us of Christ followers, that if we listen to that Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to balance and boundaries through scripture and through conviction and through community and so if we see the Trinity being about balance and boundaries, then we too, as his church, should be about these balance and boundaries that dwell and that we need to have in our lives. So many of us, we, uh, we have these limitations, we think, of, man, I would really love to do this, or God's called me to do this, and, and these limitations keep us from doing what God wants us to do. We don't have the time, or we don't have the money, or we don't have the energy to do all those things. It's like, God, I would just really wish I had more time, more energy, more resources. But the fact is, is that many of us, we have the same money, a lot of, we don't have all the same money, uh, some of us are more blessed than others, but that we have resources and that we have time and that we have energy, but we don't invest it in the right things. Because we are out of balance, we, we, we get wumpy jawed out of context, and so we can't really find that place of the Goldilocks of not too hot, not too cold. The idea that I'm, I'm orbiting around what I need to be orbiting around, and the idea that I find this balance in my life to be able to accomplish great things. And so we get to the end of our month or our, our year and go, man, where did my time go? I had all these things I wanted to do. Or where did my money go? Because at the end, I, I don't have as much as I thought. Or the idea of, man, I, I'm just so tired. I can't get these things done. Uh, a lot of it is not the idea that it's our kids, our classes, uh, our work schedule, our culture. A lot of it is that we're just not intentional with our time. And being intentional with our balance and boundaries help us be able to accomplish great things for the kingdom. And we're going to talk about throughout this month, a lot of us can do good things, but not many of us can do great things. And that's what we believe the Holy Spirit has to really push us and challenge us, not just to do good things, but to do great things for the kingdom. And so as we continue to, to walk, walk through that, we'll see that the Trinity is full of balance and boundaries and that we should reflect that. So as one of the things that we look at as ourselves, so we just could look at our planet, our universe, but we look at our bodies, that our bodies are balanced in the proportions that we have. That, uh, does anyone know that, your shoe, that this is your perfect alignment of who you are? Does anyone know that? And you're like, well, put your shoe back on. I will. Okay. Okay. Um, that the balance of our proportions are the are even how our organs work uh, to live on this planet. And that when those things get out of whack and we have too much sugar, our, our, our cholesterol is too high, or you know, all the things, that, that there's this balance in our life and that our bodies work the best when all of those things are balanced. But what separates us from the rest of the universe of the macro of the stars, the planets and the orbits and the Milky Way is that we as God's creation have a soul. 
So what separates us from the stars and the moon and the ocean and the desert is that those things were created, as Romans 1 tells us, all of that was created to point to creator God, of going, look how majestic he is. Look how big he is. Look how intentional he is. Look how balanced he is. Look at all of these things. All of that was created in order to point to God. And then God created us. He created all those things. Those things are good. And then he created Adam and Eve. And he said, this, this is very good because we were given souls and we were given a choice whether to worship, whether to point people to God or whether to point people to ourselves. And so we're gonna jump into Genesis of understanding our souls. And so Genesis 2 in the creation story we going to look at Genesis 2, verse 7. So God's created the heavens and the earth, and he's created the sun and the moon, night and day, land and sea, uh, uh, birds and of the air and uh, animals of the sea. And this is what it says in verse 7. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasure to the sight, good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here's a little bit of Bible trivia. A lot of us, we already assume, hey, Adam and Eve were created in the garden. But what did Genesis 2 just tell us? It says that, that, that man was created in the wilderness. Man was created outside of the garden and then placed. God creates paradise. He creates this place of, uh, of beauty and of majestic and understanding that this is where God will dwell with man. And he takes man out of the wilderness and he puts Adam in there. And in that also in all the creation, he puts this tree and as he put this tree, we begin to see that Adam is given direction. As we jump down uh, to verse, um, we jump down to verse 15. So this is what it says in verse 15. It says, then the Lord took the man and put him, there it is again, in the garden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat it, you shall surely die. So we've talked about balance and how God creates all these things in balance. He's created your body to be in balance and the universe to be in balance and our planet to be in balance. And if one of those things gets, gets out, of, out of whack, then things start going sideways really quick. Now we see that God establishes the very, 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 very first boundary for man. He says, anything here in this amazing, beautiful garden that I, that I put boundaries. So he says, he's the river to the west and rivers to the east. And so he's created this, this majestic oasis in the midst of the wilderness. He says, you can have anything in it, but you cannot have one thing. The tree of life. Do not eat the fruit in the tree of life. And unlike creation, we have a soul and we have a choice. And God wasn't telling Adam he couldn't have the fruit because he was trying to keep something from Adam, but he was protecting him from the dangers of it. He wasn't putting this boundary in front of Adam to keep him away from something, but protect him from it. Now that's key. Because a lot of times we think boundaries, well, well, let's get to the rest of the story. So a lot of you, uh, you know the rest of the story. If you're not in church, here's what happened. The enemy comes, uh, the devil, he comes in the form of a... Snake, serpent, I saw one yesterday. I didn't tell y'all. It was by the front porch. Um, <laughs> so there was about a five-foot black snake uh, by the front porch. I let him live. Uh, he eats bad snakes. Um, and so I always remember just how uh, the uh, devil is. So, uh, so the enemy comes as a, as a snake, but this is a snake that can walk and talk, because it's really weird. So the snake comes, and he says, hey, God is trying to keep something from you. God is being so restrictive. God just doesn't want you to have fun. God is so lame. God is just trying to keep these boundaries from you because he doesn't want you uh, to be as powerful and strong as he is. So there's not that big of a deal. These boundaries that God puts out there, no big whoop. You guys should eat. You guys should live it up. You guys should live to the fullest. You guys need, man, don't let him limit what you can and can't do. You guys should cross that boundary. And this is what he says. This is the way he puts it in uh, chapter three, verse, uh, verse four and five. He says this. He says, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, which was true because when they do that, they are now open to sin. 
They are now open to the brokenness of death and destruction and disease. That the world, perfect God, that God that put into order the world, it says in Romans, is actually mourning and grieving the fact of sin and brokenness. Because there was this boundary that the enemy said wasn't that big of a deal, and Adam and Eve listened. And we fast forward to today, and the enemy still plays the same card. You guys do what you want to do. I know God's told you not to do this and you shouldn't listen to that and you shouldn't watch that, but you guys can choose and you guys can have your own. So you really should live your life to the fullest. Don't listen to what God says in his commands. Those guardrails, they're not to protect you, they're to limit you. So, so it's not that big of a deal to watch this. It's not that big of a deal to read this. It's not that big of a deal to take that. And we, we, we buy this lie, hook, line, and sinker of understanding balance and boundaries. And we see this as a, he, we see God as restrictive and lame and the idea that he wants to destroy us and the world convinces us to remove boundaries. And I believe this is one of the greatest ways the church can live in a broken world that is out of balance and boundaries are limitless. The idea that we would put boundaries in our lives. The idea that we would live a balanced life. The the idea that our lives look different because we're choosing to follow the words and ways of Jesus. The idea that the the greatest way that we will shine in the midst of the darkness is actually not listen to the enemy, but begin to listen to the words and ways of Jesus and specifically the way that we see God putting these boundaries and balances in place. So here's our our big idea. It's this. It's that Uh, Our God is a creative God who created a balanced world full of boundaries, not to limit us, but to free us. And this is where we're going to start, all right? We need to start and, and let you know that our God, that our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that did that this triune God created a balanced world. And man, it got wompy real bad when we chose in Genesis 3 to listen to the enemy. And ever since then has there been a redemptive story to make things right again, which is, by the way, if you're new to church, that's why Jesus had to come. Because of the broken relationship that we had, Jesus had to come because there was a great chasm between us and God and that Jesus lived the life that we couldn't, died to death that we should have, defeating Satan, sin, and death so that we could be back right relationship with the Father. And so he's called us, as we look at the words and ways of Jesus, the idea of go, man, here's what balance looks like. Here's what boundaries abound. Here's the way that you're going to bear much fruit when you listen to the ways of the Father. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, my boundaries are bad. Like, that, that's going to hit me in. God's trying to restrict me. Um, the idea that I, the, I'm putting these boundaries in my life or the idea that they're negative or that we just don't want to put the work in to create these boundaries. But as we talk, and, and, and this is based on the book, Boundaries, is written about 25, 30 years ago. You can grab a copy out in the bridge. A lot of what we're gonna talk about is based on the boundaries. And it's not a self-help book, by the way. It's a biblically-based book of understanding how we are supposed to live our life in, uh, in Christ. And so as we talk about God being a creator, God who has given us these, this balance and, and, order, and boundaries in order not to keep something from us, but the idea that he's not asking something, he's not asking something from us, but he's placed these boundaries for us. So let's start with myths. So let's start, let's do some myth buster work here. Because a lot of you are like, well, here's why I shouldn't be, have boundaries. And here's why I don't have boundaries in the past. So here's the number one. And all of these are in the book. Uh, and actually there's a few more, but these are the kind of the ones I pulled out. First, uh, if I establish boundaries, I'm being selfish. Now this is the kind of the Jesus card we play as Christians uh, of like, well I, well, I would love to put boundaries, but, you know, the Bible tells me I'm to be selfless, all right, not selfish. And so if I put boundaries up, then I'm being selfish. I, I'm looking out for me and mine. And so we begin to go, I don't need to put these boundaries up. But, but here's the thing. We validate our sins and we validate our schedules being overbooked. And we validate why we should have you at church every night of the week. And, and ultimately, we burn people out. People are bit, they're bitter. There's resentment to the church and the people of the church. And one of the things we, we teach at Capstone is that you're a missionary where you work, learn, live, and play. And almost every week I have a conversation of, of someone saying, hey, I'm having a gospel conversation with people, but they've been hurt by the church or they've been burned out by the church. And because we, we push and we push and we push you and push you in the idea that you always got to be, quote unquote, doing something and the idea that, hey, you need to be selfless, you need to be selfless, you need to be selfless. 
We create this bitter, uh, bitterness in our hearts. Here's the thing. Jesus does say, hey, the world will know you're my disciples by the way that you love and the way that you serve. So here's the thing we need to understand. It's the idea of the difference between self, uh, selfishness and stewardship. Selfishness and stewardship. So if you, um, if you decide, hey, I'm going to take time off. You know what? I'm going to watch every season of Yellowstone for me. That's selfish. That's not a good steward of what God has given you. And so when we begin to put boundaries, we begin to say, hey, here's the things I'm going to say yes to, and here are the things I'm going to say no to. Because too many of us say yes to everything. And we haven't created these boundaries of going, hey, here's my sweet spot of ministry. Or here's where God uses me the best. Or here's the relationships I have. Jesus, by the way, if you didn't know this, doesn't heal everyone. He tells people no. He walks away from crowds. And he selflessly serves, but then he disengages with stewardship because he needs to go spend time with the Father. That he needs to fill his tank back up. The idea that we need to have this self-care, that we need to spend time with the Father. And Jesus talks about this with Mary and Martha. As one sister is working, 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 working selflessly, but then the other one is sitting at his feet. And she, and she thinks, hey, you need to get on to her for, for just being lazy and sitting at your feet. And Jesus says, no, she needs to be filled up. One of the reasons we encourage everyone who serves at Capstone Kids, especially, look, if you serve in first service, come hang out in second service. Don't just go serve and serve and serve and serve and never come in here because you're just giving, 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 giving. And then you get bitter and then you get hostile and then you begin to get angry. And the idea of going, hey, we want you to have a balanced life in spirituality and community with your family. That's why we don't have you here at church every night of the week. We have this and community groups. That's it. As a whole, that's, that's all we really ask. And then we want you to be missionaries where you work, learn, live, and play. Being a steward. Jesus was a steward with his time. He couldn't heal everyone. Jesus was a steward with what he did. He's like, I've got three years. He's like, what can I accomplish? Not just good, but what can I accomplish that's great? And there's many of us that are doing quote unquote good things but we're not really doing God things. We, I, I wanna do amazing things for the kingdom. But if I'm just doing good things and I can't do those amazing things. So Jesus doesn't heal everyone. He walks away in order to be with the Father. And so he's targeting his actions to accomplish great things for the kingdom. So the myth of, well, I don't wanna be selfish. We're not asking you to be selfish if you're building boundaries. It's the idea that you're being a good steward. And as you become a good steward, you work those faith muscles, guess what? You're able to carry more. Your bandwidth gets larger. You're able to do more and more for the kingdom versus just kind of maintaining and staying and giving, 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 and never being filled up. All right, so the first one is that, hey, I'm gonna be selfish. That's a myth. Second, uh, if I set boundaries, I will hurt others. So a lot of times we, we, um, we sacrifice boundaries on the altar of others. So I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to tell them no. Um, and I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, not necessarily this week, but next week, uh, we'll start um, basically a campaign of offensiveness. Uh, I will offend everyone because uh, we're going to be talking about things. That all of us have boundary issues, whether it's money, whether it's parenting, whether it's technology. There's always something that we don't always have a wrap on. And so beginning to understand that, uh, that a lot of times we don't want to hurt people. We don't, we don't want to tell our kids no. So we tell them yes all the time. And if you do that, we will pray for you uh, because you are going to raise um, uh, a crazy kid. And so the idea, uh, even in this, as, as we talk about boundaries, and again, get this book, especially for young parents. It tells you from infants and tells you why they need their mom the first six months. Then it talks about hatching and going away and, and why it gets tried to get away from mom and dad. And then it happens again as teenagers and again as young adults. Like the whole uh, scientific part of uh, why you need to give boundaries and in those boundaries you teach these young people how to be uh, adults who know how to make decisions uh, as opposed to uh, you bailing them out every time they cause an issue. Um, and so the idea is that uh, we need, we think, well, we're going to hurt little Johnny's feelings or um, the idea that I, I'm telling this person uh, PTA no or hey, I can't do this. The, the truth is, is that when we tell people no, sometimes that's what we need to do to, for the benefit of them. We talked about in James 1, the idea that when we go through challenges and conflicts and tension and difficulty, sometimes God uses that to shape us. That sometimes God is using that tension in order that we're working these faith muscles. 
And so James knew that. And, and too many times we jump in and we want to save everybody because honestly, some of us have a savior issue that we want to be everybody's savior. We want to, we want to help everybody. But maybe God's like saying, hey, maybe you need to build a boundary. You need to help them to a point. Or you don't need to necessarily do the work for them, but walk alongside of them. That sometimes we need to build these boundaries where we say, hey, here's where you need to do your own work. Hey, here's where we're gonna help you, but we're not gonna pay off that debt. Hey, here's what, and the idea that yes, you will hurt others' feelings, but in the long run, it is gonna benefit them. So don't think that just because you build boundaries or just because you tell people no, that you're gonna hurt them. We're gonna look at Galatians 6, 5 a lot. And it talk, Paul talks about there's two types of burdens. There's one that are carried on basically in a backpack. Like we're meant to carry those on ourselves, but too many times we take them off of the other people and we carry them for them on burdens we were not meant to carry. And so then we get, we get upset when that person takes advantage of us. We get frustrated when they don't listen. When we, in reality, we should just let them carry that burden because they need to kind of handle it in themselves. And that's a whole other thing we'll talk about. But then there are also burdens that in community we're meant to carry together. And so boundaries basically gives you the permission to be able to say, hey, here's where I'm gonna help others. Here's where I'm gonna carry this with others. And I, some people are meant to do that in foster care. And that's one of the ways that you can do that. Some people do that through, you know what, I'm, I'm mentoring. I'm gonna be able to walk with this child. And so not, the, not everybody's gonna carry the same thing. But just because you astound this bat, uh, boundaries doesn't mean you're going to hurt anyone. Now, you may hurt their feelings, and they may have to get over their, their self, but hopefully, as we establish these boundaries, again, Jesus told people no, by the way, that they begin to see, man, here's where God's working. Man, here's where I, I value your input and your wisdom and ability to say no and help build others up. And the last myth is this. If I set boundaries, I'm trapped. I'm trapped in these boundaries. And this is a big thing throughout the book, it talks about boundaries are, are not meant to be walls. They're not meant to have roofs and walls, but the idea that it's, it's a, um, because that makes us in, live in bunkers. And Jesus never intended us to live in bunkers in the shadows of the walls. But the idea that, that boundaries are really fences. And those fences, by the way, have gates. And there are some things in your life that are, don't need to be in that boundary. And y'all need to open up that fence and say, get on out of here. Come on, yeah. All right, you don't need to be in my life. You need to get on out of here. Come on, let's go. And we're gonna talk about some of those things. And there's some of you that need to open a gate, go, hey, I need to bring you into the boundaries because you are running wild and we're gonna bring you into here. We're gonna make you a, a wild horse to a tame one. My finances, we're gonna bring you in here. My technology, I'm gonna bring you in here. And so the idea is, is that boundaries are not walls that we hide behind, but boundaries are fences. And in those boundaries, by the way, they, they will grow and change. And so sometimes as you start, those boundaries are really big. Like when boundaries of our finances. So when we got married and Bessie was still in law school and we had one job and, and the idea of we were living on hamburger helper and cutting coupons and rolling quarters for, uh, for, for gas money. Like we were broke, broke. And so our budget was very small and that boundary, we didn't have a lot of wiggle room. But we, we made a decision and because of the boundaries we set 20 years ago, our, our boundaries are much different. But because of the decisions we made then about boundaries of finances have allowed us to accomplish the things that God's been able to do through us financially. And so as a single, your boundary is going to be different than when you get married. And as you have a young child, your boundaries may, you're going to have to open up some gates and let some things in and open up some gates and let some things out. And as you have a teenager and as you go to empty nesters, those boundaries are going to change as well. So don't think, well, I'm trapped in these boundaries. I can't, I've got to live on this budget forever. Or I've got to have this rule about technology forever. Or I've got to have this thing about times. There will be seasons. And it'll be seasons of your life, seasons of your kids' lives. But boundaries are not meant to be walls that trap you. They are fences that allow the good things in and the bad things out and give you parameter to be a good steward. A steward with your time, a steward through relationships, a steward with what God is doing in and through you. So we said the big idea is this, is our God is a creative God who created a balanced world full of boundaries, not to limit us, but free us. It's the myth of, it's not you being selfish. It's not about you hurting others. It's not about you being trapped. It's about freeing you. It's about establishing stewardship and about the idea that you've got these fences that you're beginning to, to, to model what God's calling you to do. And what you do is different than what I do. And that's why each one of us have our own boundaries. So there's gonna be exercise up on the screen. So throughout this series, we'll kind of give you exercises, homework. You can take a picture with your phone, uh, whatever you wanna do. So here's what I want you to do this week is, is draw a box. 
And these are some of the boundaries I've thought about, some of the boundaries that are in the book, and begin to say, hey, here are the things that, man, I do really good with my boundaries, like with my family. Like we, we know that one meal a day, we're gonna sit together as a family. There will be no telephones. There will be no technology, no iPads. And man, we have, we have established that as a family, and that is a good thing. You put that in the boundaries. But then it might be financially, you're, you're not running on a budget and you're running out of money and you need to really begin to get it. You need to bring that, open the gate and bring finances in. So what is it that right now is outside of those boundaries? It might be technology that you're spending too much time on your phone. It might be uh, your kids and that you're just letting them run amok and you need to b- begin to, to bring them in and begin to establish boundaries for them. Uh, again, it might be your work. Um, it might be, uh, you see it up there, rest. You might need to, to slow down. That's one of the things I've had to work on the last couple of years, especially as I went on sabbatical. The idea that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm working too much and I'm trying to accomplish too, th- too many good things. And God said, hey, I want you to slow down because I want to accomplish great things. And so begin to, to think about this. Do this in a journal. Think about, hey, here's what I'm doing really good at in boundaries. But then, man, here's what's living outside of the boundaries. And we're going to begin to work through that. We're going to begin, again, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Because each and every one of us, God's going to call us to different boundaries. But I do whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, that you'd have the courage to listen. You'd have the courage to say, hey, here, okay, God, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to be open-handed. I'm going to be open-handed with finances. I'm going to be open-handed with, with my hobbies. I'm going to be open-handed. And, and well, God, you know, that's not a big deal. We echo Genesis 3 of the enemy. It's not that big of a deal, God. It's okay if, if we're this much in debt. God, it's okay if I watch that or read that. It's okay if I do those things. Those aren't big deals. Yet God has said there's a boundary. There's a guardrail to protect you. Not because he wants something from you, because God wants something for you. Living these balanced lives of understanding we are created for his glory and his honor. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now full of thanks, full of thanksgiving full of uh, appreciation, God, that one, you created this universe in such a, a beautiful, balanced way. And God, that we would know that if one thing was different, if one thing was wrong, God, this wouldn't work. And so we thank you for being a God of balance for the, from the macro of the planets and stars and orbits to the micro of how our bodies work and the, the, the things that are in us that help keep us going. God, I thank you for your word and scripture. And as we're gonna to continue to dive into this series, Lord, that, that you are a God of balance and that you are a God of boundaries. And that you're not giving us these boundaries because, again, you don't want us to, quote unquote, have fun or you want us to, you wanna restrict us, God, but this, you want something to have us, as Jesus said, to have life and have it to the fullest. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you, the first and foremost, that they would uh, open their hearts to you. That, that gate that they would open and they've maybe built walls up, that God, they would open up and say, hey, I want to become a Christ follower and begin his following Jesus. I want to follow through the uh, waters of baptism just like we saw this morning. Lord, if there are people here, my brothers and sisters, who they recognize, man, they've got issues and they've got, they've got boundaries and that they haven't set on certain things or certain vices in their lives, then confess that to you. That they would seek you out to find guidance, to be able to bring those things in under your boundaries, under your balance of what it means to live a life, to be in the world, but not of the world. We thank you for our gospel community, for our church. And so many of the stories in this are stories who have overcome, stories that have brought those, those, those vices in to a boundary and not only done that, but they've used that to your glory. They've shared how they chased after the dreams of the world. They, they sought first, not your kingdom, but their own desires. And when they stopped doing that and, and began to seek first your kingdom and the boundaries and balance of, your, of you, man, their life began to flourish. So Lord, if there's someone here today who's struggling, if there's someone here today of hope, Lord, I pray that we've been able to point them to you, that they would talk to me or others, that we would be able to pray for them, that they are in this place, a safe place, a place where we don't have all the answers, a place where we can't fix everything, but a place where we come and worship a risen Savior, a place where we come to worship a creator God. And we allow the Holy Spirit here with us today to lead us and guide us. In your son's holy name, amen.